I think I want to warn you at the very start that this isn't an ordinary view of the House of Commons. Parliament itself has been going for over 700 years, and I've been here for 45 of them. And over the last 12 months, I've been going around with my video camera, taking some very unusual views of the place. At the moment, I'm high up in the dome, above the central lobby, waiting with my camera for the speaker to appear. Every day at 2.25, the speaker leaves her house in the palace and forms a procession with her chaplain, her secretary, her train bearer, and the sergeant at arms. On this occasion, I was hoping not to catch the speaker's eye. This is a daily ritual, and the central lobby is normally packed with people waiting to see it. Just before we elected Betty Boothroyd as Speaker three years ago, I argued for a modern Parliament. If Parliament is to survive, it must be a workshop and not a museum. What advice would you give to a new member? Obey the Chief Whips. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to look after them right. and my boys. I'm the man that winds up and looks after Big Ben. Nothing must go wrong in this building, ever. If you want to know what visitors think about the Houses of Parliament, you can't do better than ask a policeman. They, they have no idea, I don't think, because of the uh, diplomatic goings on between the, the parties. They don't realise, they think that the parties hate each other, but really they're best of friends and people talk to each other. They don't, when yeah. they come out and Tony Blair talking to one of the MP for the Conservative Party, they don't realise yeah. that really they're friends in the background. It's just their party differences that, that divide yeah. them. For most visitors, however, it is much more like a museum than a working legislature. These French students were a bit surprised to learn that the royal assent to acts of parliament is still, even today, given in Norman French, La Reine Le Volt, reflecting the French conquest of England by William, Duke of Normandy. And it was, of course, the same William the Conqueror who was responsible for the oldest part of the building, Westminster Hall, which was built some time after 1066 the second attempt after Julius Caesar to get Britain into the European Union. It has a beautiful hammer beam roof built in 1399. And when my friend Eric Heffer MP took some of his carpenter friends from Liverpool round, it was the craftsmanship which excited them most. The original oak beams had to be replaced in 1910 because they had become infected with the Death Watch beetle, so called because all the beetles ticked in unison like a watch. First of all, when they took the old roof down, they discovered some tennis balls up in the roof, uh, which were allegedly uh, hit up there at the time of Elizabeth I. No doubt somebody said, oh, damn, I'll, I'll bring them down tomorrow. And they remained from then right up to 1910. And secondly, when they came to order the new oak, um, they looked up where the original oak had come from, and some of it had come from the estate of a man called Lord Cawthorpe. And in 1910, there still was a Lord Cawthorpe, so they wrote him a letter and saying, uh, further to our order of oak for 1097, we'd like some more. In the old days, it was used for, as a sort of marketplace. There were stalls and coffee houses, but now they've cleared them all out, and I think it's an awful pity myself. If you come on some days, you'll find lawyers talking here, as they might have done in medieval times. Apart from that, um, when great uh, figures, kings and queens uh, die, their bodies lie in state here. And as a child, 
at the death of uh, George V, I came and I trailed past here. Then George VI lay in state here, and I remember seeing three queens, Queen Mary, uh, the present Queen Mother, and the present Queen standing just by the coffin of George VI. Nora Wool runs a flower shop in the Commons and arranges the flowers all over the house for the many restaurants and canteens which are used by 651 MPs, nearly 1,200 peers and 12,000 staff. I've always been rather frightened of you, you know, when I've walked by, I tell Why? you. Well, because you're always very busy and I always feel that... Probably, um, probably being rude to somebody. No, you've never been rude to anybody in your life. Oh, I have. Have you? Oh, yes. But you find people here are fairly friendly, don't you? Everybody. Everybody. Yes. Well, they must have disturbed you, but it's very nice to see you again anyway. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. Next to the terrace, further down, is a very pleasant and popular members cafeteria where we can take our friends. And it's where I like to eat. So I went along for a chat with the supervisor, Georgina Cook. What did you do before you came here, Gina? I was actually working in a painting shop. Did you? <laughs> well, it's not so different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that. You must have met every member of Parliament. I don't think so. Have you not? I have don't you, uh, think uh, did so. Prime Ministers ever come into the members? Yes, Harlow Wilson. Yes. He came in. And Lord Callaghan. Yes. He came in. Um, I've seen the Edward Heath a few times, not a lot. Um, Mrs. Thatcher all, has been in. All the time, yeah. yeah. She always, even after Prime Minister, yeah. if there was a three line whip, she was always in, yes. yes. And uh, I've seen John Major a few times, not a lot, but I've seen yes. a few times, yeah. Because yeah. that's what makes it nice that people do mix up a bit, although they're mm. all in a hierarchy, they mix up. I think they mix very well in there, in my little place, actually. Well, now. You must see a few things. Is there a, a rule of confidentiality? I've had in the past phone calls from reporters. Ah. Um, but they've done a, a programme, was it a year, two years ago, on Mrs Thatcher about how people felt when she resigned. Oh, yes. And I got a phone call, and I thought it was somebody pulling my leg, like one of the other staff. Because yeah. I started joking about it. But I must have sounded interested to her because she phoned up five times oh. wanting me to go on television. And I refused. I said, I didn't want to know. Now, can I ask you this? Because working in the House, I mean, the purpose of the place is as a, a House of Parliament, which uh, is why I'm here. Uh, how does it feel to work here? What's it like to work here? In many ways, I don't find it terribly different to, to running a catering operation in some large institution. Um, we are providing a service to our customers. Our customers are made up of members of the house. They are made up of staff, anybody who works in this building. I'd never done catering before. And the first day they put me on the hot plate, who's the first one I serve but Enoch Powell? Well, once you get in oil of pearl, he's really, really a lovely gentleman. He is. But you've got this fear. You're, you're a bit... And I've never done it before. I've, I got the fish up, and I picked the fish up, and I filled my soup. <laughs> and it's floating about the soup. And he looked round, there was nobody around. He says, just flick it out and get me another one. After that, he was my hero. Uh. <laughs> the soup, fish is floating about the soup. <laughs> yeah. When you say it's a bit like an institution, I know what you mean, but it's a bit warmer than that. There's a bit of a family feeling here. Don't you feel that? What is difficult, of course, for the staff is that the degree of familiarity that some members enjoy, others do not, and they have to know where to draw the line. Anybody that comes into work here, I can honestly tell you, if you go and ask my colleagues in there, after six weeks, I'll be watching Question Time. <laughs> Anything that's got a member in television, you'll get the next day if we're not wanting late, or they'll video it. Um, did you see Question Time last night? Weren't they good? Mm -hmm. You don't get enough of it, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. 
Right at the other end of the building is the Victoria Tower. And I went up there to meet David Johnson, who is the clerk of all the records. Well, the Victoria Tower was designed by Charles Barry right from the start as a record repository. And in those days, in the 1830s, he thought it was going to be big enough to hold not only the records of Parliament, but also the records of the courts as well. This act, 1642, 1641-2, yes. 2 is an act for reducing the rebels in Ireland at the time of Charles I. And of course, in the old days before the printing, the clerks had to read the bill. That's why they talk about a first reading, second reading, third reading. And you were saying in the House of Lords they still have a reading clerk. Indeed, indeed yes. Who reads the uh, words of assent at the end. When Charles I was King of England, have you talked about that yeah, period yeah, at school? Oliver Cromwell. Where he ran away and he got his head chopped off in the end and Oliver Cromwell... That's right. Well, well, why did all this happen? Because it was a civil, civil war between the roundheads and the cavaliers. This is the death warrant of Charles I, which is probably the most famous document that we have in the record office. And it dates from late January 1649. In fact, if you look carefully at it, you'll see that there are a number of places where the parchment has been scratched out and then uh, a, a new date or a new name has been overwritten. And we suspect that that means there was some delay uh, before the uh, document was finalized. Below are the signatures and the seals of all the regicides. Uh, the most famous, of course, being Oliver Cromwell's just, just here. There you can see his signature. It's an amazing thing when you think of the fierce passions aroused by the English Revolution of 1649 that Parliament should ever have agreed to put up a statue to Oliver Cromwell. There he is, standing with his sword in one hand and his Bible in the other, the Lord Protector from 1649 to 1658. England was a republic for 10 years, long before America, France or Russia, though they don't make much of it now in our school history books. And the founders of that republic were very severely treated, and you have to look very hard to find monuments to them. This plaque on St Margaret's uh, Westminster lists those people who had supported the English Commonwealth or Republic under Cromwell had died, been buried in Westminster Abbey as honoured citizens, and when the monarchy was restored in 1660, they were removed by the King from Westminster Abbey, and their bodies were just put in the graveyard here. And among the people listed is Elizabeth, the mother of Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell's body was dug up cut into four parts and his head stuck on a pike staff and publicly displayed as a warning to anyone else who might dare to challenge the supremacy of the crown. But strangely, even today, no monarch is allowed into the House of Commons and never has been since the English Revolution. Apart from the state opening of Parliament, which takes place every year, the Queen rarely visits the Palace of Westminster and when she does, the whole place is turned upside down. Was it you who did the red carpet? Yes, we did. We got some pictures of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did the red carpet. We got um, really involved when it comes to the Queen coming. On royal occasions such as this, this one was to commemorate VE Day in May this year, the Houses of Parliament revert to being a real palace under the authority of the Lord Great Chamberlain. The Yeoman of the Guard and the Gentlemen at Arms miraculously appear as if to take over the place themselves. visits always remind me that democracy is still on sufferance and even prime ministers, party leaders and MPs 
are reduced to the status of spectators in Westminster Hall. We were fortunate enough to stay just up here on the steps. What, they the let us watch it from the steps, oh, which really, was really nice. That's a nice idea. Oh, I'm sure, because otherwise you'd have been shut out once yes. you began. So you were up at the top there on the way to the uh, Grand On the way Committee. to the turret, yeah. Well, Where were you on VE Day when uh, we were all gathered at Westminster Hall? Um, I was actually outside St Steve's entrance, standing on the red carpet, um, just behind the door gate chain in, uh, or chummy. As the Queen arrived um, and she met Lord Chummy, as he turned round, then I processed into the uh, Westminster Hall and up the steps, and just before the fair. And as another reminder of our history, when the Queen took her seat on the red carpet, she was sitting just above the very spot where Charles I had stood trial and was sentenced to death by the Commons. While these great functions are always organised with military precision, occasionally there are some unseen dramas going on up the clock tower. What happened was we had a, a bulk light on here and the bulb went and they asked this man to change the bulb. As I went to change it, the ladder slipped and I hit the mechanism arm and uh, Quarter to nine, it might struck nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, it struck ten o'clock. Ten o'clock, it struck eleven o'clock. Then I had to get the main, the people to maintain the clock in to do it. We'd just done it with about ten minutes to spare as the Queen was coming past the gates. When I reached 4,691 visits, that put me in the Guinness Book of Records. And they said those visits were equivalent to ascending Mount Everest 29 times. I used to smoke up to 60 cigarettes a day at work, and then I gave it up just roughly about two years ago, and I've not touched one since. Before, when I was smoking, I was like a little squirrel up and down and it, it sort of appeared to be effortlessly, but now I've packed up smoking and as a result putting weight on, it, I am finding it slightly harder than I did before. They say, um, a member told me that it, this was documented, that apparently a soldier who was accused of being asleep at his post when he was court-martialed, um, in his defence, he maintained that he heard Big Ben strike 13. And the story says that if, if I heard it strike 13, how could I have been asleep at my post? So they stopped the court-martial, they checked it with the powers that be here, and apparently the clock did strike 13, and that saves a soldier from possibly being shot. I'm sitting in the prison cell a third of the way up Big Ben, where Charles Bradlaugh, Member of Parliament for Northampton, was imprisoned because although elected four times for Northampton, as an atheist he refused to take the oath which is required of every member, I swear by Almighty God that I will bear faithful and true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Victoria, her heirs and successors according to law. And Bradlaugh, having arrived and refusing to take the oath, he was placed into the custody of the sergeant at arms. And I have here uh, a manuscript photocopy of the police report. I assisted the sergeant at arms in taking Mr. Bradlaugh to the prison rooms, where he remained in charge of a messenger 
and Police Constable 162 Mackay all day. I have a tremendous affection for Charles Bradlaugh because I was thrown out of the House of Commons. It's a long story, but uh, I was elected in 1950, and 10 years later, my dad, who was a Labour peer, he'd been an MP, died, and they said I had inherited his peerage, which I didn't want, I tried to get rid of it. The House threw me out, called for a by-election. I stood as a disqualified candidate in that by-election, and I was re-elected with a much bigger majority for my old constituency. So I turned up as the new member for Bristol South East, but the Speaker ordered that I should be kept out, if necessary, by force. Two judges in an election court then disqualified me and awarded my seat to the Conservative candidate I'd just defeated. There was such a row that two years later, in 1963, Parliament changed the law to allow peers to renounce their titles. A further by-election was held. And this time, as a commoner, I was eligible. Anthony Neil Wedgwood Ben, 20,300. <laughs> you have defeated the Tory cabinet. You have defeated the House of Lords. You have defeated the courts. You have changed the constitution of this country by your own power. And I learned a lot from that battle and I learned a lot from Charles Bradlaugh too. I went to the cell the other day to see that down by the members' entrance. I've never been in cell. Your, your, your. The House of Commons still has its own prison today under the control of the Sergeant at Arms complete with its own lavatory. There's an absolute hierarchy of lavatories in the Houses of Parliament. The bishops have their own lavatory, so do the peers and the peeresses. There are separate lavatories for members and others for lady members. There are male and female staff lavatories. They even have lavatories for gentlemen. But it all ends up in the same place. So we're coming down now to the sewage ejector plant. That's right, yes. It's where all the sewage and wastewater, etc., from the palace, um, surface water, uh, is taken out. Now this is the uh, sewage ejector chamber, and these are the original shown sewage ejectors. This is what, how old then? Um, about 1887. That would have taken Mr. Gladstone's uh, excavator out of the building. Uh, just about, I would think, yes, just about. Where does the sewage get pumped then? Well, it goes out through the pipe and into one of the main drains. Are you aware, as it were, that it's a parliament, or is it just a huge maintenance job that you do? It's a bit of both. I, I'm aware that it is parliament, and uh, I get a great thrill out of uh, working here because of that. Um, I just can't imagine working anywhere else. Yes, by all means. And that's, that's the action of it, and that's all it is. It's ever so simple. It's a beautiful bit of equipment. Mm, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Now we're sitting at what's called the bandstand, yes. which is exactly where in the building? It's the support for our central lobby. The central lobby is the one place where the public have the right to come and meet their members of parliament, and it's usually crowded with people. Tell me when you first came to Mr. Andrews, who's a very well-known figure in the down. House, has come every day for many years, and he sits there writing petitions to the Queen. There may be constituents with problems, visitors hoping for gallery tickets to a debate, and people lobbying to secure some change in the law. And on this occasion, there's a special group of midwives who transformed the central lobby into a nursery. Ah, so it's a feminist argument as well, is it? To some extent. To get to the central lobby, all visitors pass through St. Stephen's Hall, 
But few stop to ask what the statues and paintings lining the walls tell us about our history. For example, Edmund Burke, who was my predecessor as MP for Bristol in the 1790s, once contemptuously described the public as the swinish multitude, and he only visited Bristol four times in the six years that he represented it. These people gathered in the fields are defying the Heresy Act of 1401, which condemned men and women to be burned at the stake if they were found reading the Bible, which was then seen by Parliament as a dangerous and revolutionary document that must not fall into the hands of the poor. On April the 27th, 1909, Marjorie Hume, who was a suffragette, came here and in order to make her protest, she chained herself round the spur of the statue of Lord Falkland and his sword, and in order to release her, they had to break the spur and break the sword, so they put up a little plaque. But I tell you what I feel when I look at this is, this place is full of statues and paintings of so-called famous parliamentarians, not one of whom believed that women should have the vote, or for that matter, that working men should have the vote. So it is significant that there's only a tiny reminder of the struggle for democracy. The rest is all about the feudal parliament, and not an awful lot, you know, has changed. But sometimes even the House seems to forget. May I say, may I then say this to the honourable lady about breaking the rules? She wouldn't have had the vote if the Pankhurst hadn't trained themselves to the railing. And the House very often has to face the fact that unfair rules are contested. And my experience of the political process is the last people to get the message is the House of Commons itself. To commemorate the people who fought for democracy over the centuries and to celebrate the skill and devotion of those who built the palace and now work here, I had two brass plaques made and secretly screwed them up in a small cupboard. They were immediately removed by the authorities. Happily, an earlier one, which I had put up in the same broom cupboard in memory of Emily Wilding Davison, a suffragette, has survived. She hid there in 1911 to make the claim of women to be in Parliament and later died when she threw herself under the King's horse at the Derby in 1913. Every day, that plaque is lovingly polished. The Civil Rights Disabled Persons Bill will only become law with pressure that exists from outside Parliament, reflecting upon us inside Parliament. Every day, people come to Parliament to demand reform. We want to raise awareness of the situation of animals being exported and we want it to stop now. Immediately, yes. Why are you here? For our Belgian medicals! You're a physiotherapist, working yeah? Working in Newcastle. Yeah. We've come down to represent other physiotherapists working in Newcastle. Tony! Tony! Give them Tony! Make Hello. sure you're in the house tonight at 8 o'clock for the adjournment meeting right. on pay. Oh, uh, tonight? 8 o'clock. We want you there. These popular demands are eventually reflected in the issues that come before Parliament for debate. When a division is called in the Commons, a bell is rung insistently to summon MPs to the division lobbies to vote. What's going on? What's this for? Oh, that? I don't know. It's Tony, so it's better. Yeah. We're called doorkeepers because primarily our job is to attend or lock the doors during divisions in the Chamber of the House of Commons. As soon as the Speaker puts the question and she says, clear the lobbies, I shout division, I ring the bells, and the bells, as you know, they ring not only in the house, but they go around to many of the restaurants and yeah. places around central London. Uh, and the members have eight minutes to actually get in the house. You can get in and out of the chamber from two doors here and to, and to each end. Then when you get here, when there's a vote, 
these pull out and this so you can't get through the middle if you know what I mean and there's a clerk sitting there and uh, K to Z's go that way and A to J's here and as you go by you give your name and the clerk ticks you off and then you go to the door and I'll show you what happens there the door is opened um, to this middle position so you have to squeeze your way through and there's a teller on each side one from each side so whatever the vote is there'll be one teller supporting the eyes and one the nose and you come in and come out and you bow and the, the, one of the tellers says one two 144 and then at the end you've probably seen it on television the tellers come forward the eyes to the right 314. The nose to the left, 390. The eyes to the right, 314. The nose to the left, 319. The nose have it, order and lock. The only time I've ever seen any drama is when a member nearly misses a vote yes. and I've seen a doorkeeper close the door yes, right. after eight minutes and somebody yes. charge up yes, right. quite heavy members yes. and if the door is locked there's no, you, you, you've no right to budge. Well, I don't know if anyone's yeah. ever been hurt, but I, one or two people have really thrown themselves I at it. I think there's only ever been one case to my knowledge that uh, one of the door keys, just prior to actually turning the key, got knocked through the door. <laughs> and uh, the, the division in that case was aborted. Oh, it was really? taken Somebody again. complained. Oh, yeah. they, they <coughs> oh, yes. reported yeah. to the sergeant. Oh, right? yes, yes. Um, the, and the division was taken again, and in fact, he got a letter of apology from the speaker the next day. How many Definitely. clocks are there altogether? There's about 2,500 on the parliamentary estate. Yeah. So they all have to be really looked after, whether they're wound or electrical or what the master system is. Because, as you know, Parliament is controlled by time. At 10 o'clock the debate ends, right. you've got eight minutes to get into the lobby. Everything is controlled That's by right. time. That's right, yeah. have to leave the chamber in a secret session yourself? Yes. During a secret session, all the doorkeepers, um, not the sergeant aisle, but the doorkeepers come outside, all the speakers are switched off, the galleries are cleared and locked, and all the ventilation systems are checked in the, in the um, chamber, and all the doors, the whole citadel, is locked. After the new house was opened in 1950, because it had been bombed in 1941, they installed a submarine periscope in the ceiling. This allows the engineers to maintain an even temperature and control the blinds on the windows in the chamber, but it has to be locked off in a secret session. The cry of I spy strangers goes up, the galleries are cleared, policemen are placed everywhere where there is uh, facility for hearing what goes on in the chamber and seeing what goes on in the chamber and the periscope muff is placed over and locked off. The police then stand guard to make sure that nobody unlocks it. <laughs> There's one corner of the place that nobody ever sees if you go up the steps at the end of Westminster Hall. And well this is the Grand Committee room but if, if instead of going in there you go up through this little door, you come up to a turret, which visitors certainly never see. Now I'm coming up 
the turret stairs and going into the room where all the cleaners work. And this is where the real work is done. And people you never see, because by the time people have arrived, the place is spotlessly clean. Yeah, they start at half past five, six o'clock in the morning. You've got all night cleaners. What time do you get up in the morning? I get up about four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We have a quick shower, cup of tea. Yeah. And on the road by quarter to five. And what time do you finish? One o'clock, half past one. Oh, gosh, it's a long day. It's a long day. Do you get an early night, or do you find you fi when you get home? No, you've got to do your own elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, what did you feel when you first came here? When you the first day you worked here? It was just amazement. Lost. Yeah. Um, didn't realise that you had sort of traffic lights. Mm. in here and little roads and <laughs> it's just like a village. It is a village. Yeah. It? it is a village. Yeah, it, I mean, I think we were lost for a good four weeks. Yeah. Now, how many members have you got to know, as it were, as distinct from just seeing them about? Um, what about your own MP? Who's your own MP? Where you live? Oh. No, I'm lost. Don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very good answer, that, actually. It's a very, very yeah. good answer. Pugin room, and it's one of the very few places, indeed the only place in the Palace of Westminster, where there's any recognition of the craft that went into the building, of the new building. And uh, you can see here, in that glass case, the uh, mallet and chisels used on the building of the House of Parliament by Henry Broadhurst, a stonemason. these last once they're finished? Please. Hundreds of years? 200. 200, 200 years, yeah. 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 The rainwater dissolves limestone. It's a slow process, but it yeah. uh, slowly dissolves it. Yeah. Because yeah. I think the skill of the craftsmen who build these buildings is just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, and nobody yeah. ever really recognises it, do they? They no. just go around no, look at it and just take around them. and you never look up. Many of the stone figures depict power and authority with kings and lions, but my favourites are the ones which are more disrespectful and may more accurately reflect what the common people thought of their feudal masters. Near the House of Lords Record Office is the bindery where British library staff restore and sew old books with great care and skill. Yes. Appropriately, the first book I saw there was a history of the French royal family whose descendants have occupied the British throne almost ever since. I grease off my nose and allows me to pick up the gold and transfer it to the book. Chris Charles was brushing gold leaf onto the spine of a book, which he had coated with the traditional ingredients of egg white, vinegar, milk, and water. Paul was put two coats of gold on leather because it's a metal. When you when you press into the leather, because the leather is soft, um, the metal literally breaks. It cracks, so with two layers, inevitably it doesn't break in the same place, so you keep a nice, a nice structure. Now you're fusing the gold onto the leather with that, is that what you're doing? Yes, with the, with the heat of the tool, I'm literally frying that egg white that I put on earlier. 
and, and the, the, a a the action is, is bonding. Now, there are a lot of little letters here you could see, but how did they get there? Or did you press them gently? No, they've all been done exactly the same way as I'm doing this now. Oh, I see, I see. Let's see. And we have a, a gold rubber, which is um, just made of um, pure rubber and paraffin. Uh, 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 uh. Amazing. December the 11th, 1189, Richard I, Richard Coeur de Lyon, as he was called, uh, set sail for Palestine in order to rescue Jerusalem from uh, the Saracens. It was, of course, the first Gulf War. It's the only way in which you could look at it, because it was a war between Christianity and Islam. What's interesting to me about it is that the Crusades had all the characteristics of the Gulf War 800 years later. I remember in Algeria, a few years back, I met a former foreign minister of Egypt, and he said, we've had a seminar on the Crusades in Cairo. So I said, what did you discover? Well, he said, we discovered many things, one of which was that during the Crusades, the European arms manufacturers supplied weapons both to Richard I and to Saladin, who was the Kurdish leader of the Saracens. And I was also much struck that uh, in uh, 1995, the Secretary General of NATO, Willie Klass, said that now that communism was over, the uh, great enemy of the West was Islam. So unless we're very careful, the religious war between Christianity and Islam will curse the next generation as the Cold War did the last. So this picture to me is an extremely interesting one and one that I think has a lot uh, to tell us about the world in which we live today. Tell me where we are coming to now. Right, we're just coming into the roof space, roof void, above the Lord's Chamber. You've just come uh, through from, um, from the Piers Meeting area, Piers Lobby, yeah. come through the doors, and now we're going in above the chamber. Now, what can you see? Um, if you look down the gratings in front of us, you can see uh, the, the chairs, and eventually going on down, you'll see the, uh, the wall sack and the throne. Yes, you wouldn't notice when you're down there that there was this roof void at all, would you? It's a huge space, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Have you ever been involved as a fireman in fires in the palace before you came here? Yes, I have. I think it was uh, 71, 72. Uh, that was the fire in Westminster Hall in the roof. I remember that, I think it yeah. was the Grand Committee room. And uh, yes, I was uh, on the roof firefighting as the uh, slates or tiles were yeah. coming down towards us. Because uh, with the great fire of 1834, which burned so much of it down, they've been very sensitive about fire ever since. Well, yes, they would have had a, a kind of a water tank near them, lever lined, I presume, uh, and you would have had guys with buckets from a suitable water supply to tip into the tank whilst the men used their hand pumps to build the pressure up. They'd have had the old leather uh, pipes, wouldn't they, in those days? Would carry... Absolutely, but of course, leather and uh, water, they're immensely heavy uh, yeah, once they get right. wet. Right. Unlike modern day hose today, which is... Um, Nylon, is it? Or that's right, portable, yeah, yeah. rubber lined. This is a Viscount's coronet. Got 16 balls round it. And it's only worn at the coronation. But if you've got blue blood, you get one of these. And the blood and this symbolise that you're allowed to be in Parliament forever and ever and ever, whoever wins the next election. To get into the House of Commons, of course, you have to be elected. People have to vote for you. And when you arrive with the proof that you've been elected, you have to take an oath of allegiance to the Crown 
before you can take your seat, and if you don't, they fine you £500 a day. To get into the House of Lords, you're either made a peer, and the last 10 Prime Ministers have put 800 people into the House of Lords, or you inherit a peerage. To get a peerage, you have to have letters patent, and the letters patent are all beautifully illuminated, and they have the royal seal, and when you're a peer, your blood turns blue. And before I renounced, I went to hospital and I said I'd like to have a little blue blood before I get rid of it. So here is a genuine bottle of blue blood. And that is the entitlement of somebody to sit in the House of Lords. It is uh, the only parliament in the world that works this way. We claim that uh, everyone would like to copy British democracy but it is a very limited democracy because only one-third of it is controlled by the people through the ballot box. The rest is the Crown, which is hereditary, and the House of Lords, which is by patronage and sometimes by heredity as well. I sometimes think of the democratic process as being like a steam engine which converts hot air into orderly movement. This one, quietly operating underneath the commons, powers the pump, which as we've seen, expels the sewage from the Palace of Westminster. Today, there's a great deal more hot air from the mass media, and their steam engines have largely taken over from ours. The most recent and clearest example of this was during the Conservative Party leadership election in the summer of 1995. The TV cameras were waiting like vultures outside the House of Commons while I was able to slip into the corridor next to the committee room where the votes were being counted and I managed to get a unique picture of that very scene. On these great media occasions, College Green, a triangle of grass literally across the road from the Commons, replaces the chamber, and it is here that the members of Parliament are summoned by the princes and princesses of TV and radio to be interrogated. I took these pictures with my camera to show the media as they exercise their power. If you tell me it's happening, we'll, we'll throw back. Sorry, not at all. That means that people are issues of that kind. The whole string of successes he's had. But the most important thing, uh, and this I fear is going to have to be my last word on it, because I... Gotcha. He's done it. Who you got on your shoulder, yeah? This is my film. Have you been doing a million interviews? Yes, yes, I have, yes. Well, I just walked out to do one, and I, I come still trying to get back to the house. I'm trying to make a speech. Well, the, the, the house man. is adjourned. Here's the man. Here's the man. Here's the man. Here's the if you want to know where power exists, here, where you are. But it certainly is going to change something if Mr. Mason... Well, I'm not interested in that. And you see, that's all you're interested in. You're like a lot of gossiping courtiers in well, some medieval monarch's palace <laughs> saying, who's going up? Which prince is popular? Is the princess going to be divorced? You know, that's all you're interested in. And I, if democracy ever dies, it won't be the Red Army. It'll be the media that destroy democracy by denying people the voice so they can tell the government what they want. Anyway, that's what I feel. Take care. All right, look after yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here we go, Peter. I love taking children around the House of Commons. They always enjoy it. They're very idealistic. They're very excited. And I think it's important that they should have fun while they're here. Because, after all, the House of Parliament belongs to them. Last April, I was 70, and my family and friends gave me a lovely party with the most beautiful cake, and there were also some surprises as well. In my case, I would be taking the sole of course, 
And if the next generation want Parliament to be a workplace and not a museum, they've got to keep up the pressure for social justice from outside and bring it to the chamber itself. Order, order. <laughs>